Not all nuclear catastrophes are powerful explosions followed by shockwaves and fires responsible for vast destruction. Sometimes these accidents happen rather quietly and imperceptibly. So much so that the people at the epicenter of these events don't immediately realize what happened. Radiation is invisible and that's its greatest danger. In this episode of Simple Infographics, we'll talk about the quiet accident at the Tokemura radiochemical plant in Japan and the human casualties it caused. Located in the Ibaraki prefecture of western Japan, the small village of Tokai doesn't attract much attention. The peaceful oceanside town is home to less than 40,000 people. However, it was here that Japan's first nuclear power plant was built in 1965. And in the 1980s, a commercial nuclear fuel production company named JCO settled in Tokemura. In 1983, JCO completed construction of their second plant in the area, and operations began. Specialists processed uranium at the industrial site. The raw material was converted into uranium dioxide, which was later used to manufacture fuel for commercial nuclear power plants in Japan. The JCO plant mainly worked with low enriched uranium, with concentrations no more than 5%. But sometimes they processed uranium with highly enriched uranium, with a concentration of 18.8% for an experimental reactor. Because these operations were considered to be high risk, they were rarely undertaken at JCO. On September 30th, 1999, around 10 a.m., three plant employees, Yutaka Yokokawa, Masato Shinohara, and Hasachi Auchi, were preparing to convert highly enriched uranium. This was the first time JCO had processed highly enriched uranium in three years. The resulting fuel was intended for use in the Joyo Experimental Fast Breeder Reactor at the Ori Research Establishment. It's important to mention that working with high-risk substances requires compliance with the safety requirements established by Japan's Science and Technology Agency. The procedure should be conducted in a special tank where uranium oxide is mixed with nitric acid. Then the resulting mixture goes into a buffer tank and from there into the sump. In the sump, the substance is cooled with water and purified with ammonia. Then, the completed product can be extracted for future use. This rather long procedure ensures safety and allows plant employees to keep the reaction under control. But in 1996, the JCO plant decided that such a multi-step procedure was too complex and expensive. So, plant management abandoned the procedure in favor of simpler cleaning methods when working with highly enriched uranium. The government didn't necessarily monitor the Tokemura plant, because it wasn't on the list of the country's leading nuclear enterprises. As a result, all workplace violations went unnoticed. This is one of the many things that led to the tragedy. On the morning of September 30th, 1999, the station employees acted accordingly to the simplified procedures that the plant had adopted. They started their work with uranium on the 29th, continuing the ongoing process the next day. The first deviation from the licensed procedure was that they dissolved the uranium in open 10-liter stainless steel buckets instead of in the required solvent reactor. This saved them some time, taking an hour off the total procedure time. Another deviation from the rules was that they poured the urinal nitrate solution into an improperly shaped reactor. It had a 100 liter capacity with a 450 millimeter diameter and a height of 610 millimeters. The drain tap was only 10 centimeters off the floor. These two factors alone wouldn't have led to such dire consequences had it not been for a third factor, ordinary human ignorance. The plant worked with highly enriched uranium very rarely, which meant the employees had very little experience with it and lacked the necessary qualifications to carry out the procedure. On September 29th, workers prepared four batches of the solution, 2.4 kilograms each. On the 30th day, they had to prepare another three batches. Around 10.35 a.m., it was time to prepare the final, seventh batch. Just as the last of the uranium was poured into the reactor, emergency radiation alarms sounded in the production facility and two neighboring buildings. At this point, 40 liters of the solution had already accumulated in the sump, including 16 liters of uranium. In this procedure, 2.4 kilograms was considered the maximum amount of uranium permissible. Now, in theory, the critical mass of uranium-235 is 45 kilograms, but this threshold is substantially lower when dealing with a solution. This is because water, located in a special compartment of the reactor, acts as a neutron inhibitor. So as a result, a self-sustaining chain reaction started in the sump, which proved difficult to stop. One of the signs that the procedure went awry was the appearance of Cherenkov radiation, a glow that appears when a charged particle passes through a transparent medium at a speed greater than the phase velocity of light in the same medium. As he was leaning over the sump, the plant employee adding the seventh bucket of urinal nitrate saw a blue flash of dangerous radiation. Practically immediately, the operators in the building started to feel sick. It became hard for them to breathe, different parts of their bodies started to hurt, and nausea rolled up in their throats. 
The man who saw the flash lost consciousness a few minutes later in the decontamination. After the alarm sounded, the employees of all buildings, following protocol, left their posts and gathered at a special evacuation point. As soon as people evacuated the buildings, measurements of the site's gamma radiation levels were taken. The results were frightening. In some places, they were over 1,000 times the natural background value. Then began the evacuation of all residents who lived within a 350-meter radius from the plant. All in all, 161 people were evacuated from 39 residential buildings. As it turns out, the measures were taken in a very timely manner, four and a half hours after the accident. Radiation measurements taken on the edge of the facility grounds showed a value of 5 millisieverts per hour. For reference, people receive about 0.1 millisieverts of radiation during one hour on an ordinary airplane flight, and the typical person receives between 1 and 10 millisieverts of radiation per year. Twelve hours after the accident, local authorities came to check on residents whose homes were within a 10-kilometer radius of the plant. They were warned about the resulting radiation and were urged to stay indoors. In total, about 300,000 people were considered to be at risk. Meanwhile, the reaction in the uranium tank continued. Shortly after midnight, plant management decided to try to stop the reaction. They formed nine teams of three people each, 27 people total. The teams replaced each other often as it was dangerous to be near the epicenter for too long. Their mission? To drain the water out of the tank's cooling jacket. This layer of water was supposed to cool the tank down, but during the accident, the water in the jacket reflected neutrons back into the tank, causing more and more uranium fissions. Experts believed that if the water was drained out, the reaction would slow down and eventually come to a halt. However, for safety, employees dismantled and blocked the supply pipeline from the outside, rather than going inside the building to do it. It took the crews 17 hours to dismantle the structures and drain the water. But this first attempt didn't work. There was still liquid left behind in the reactor, as was evidenced by the indicators on their devices. As a result, the reaction did slow down, but then regained momentum and stabilized. They finally managed to drain the remaining water, and they poured boric acid into the reactor through special hoses. This was done to absorb the remaining neutrons and then further reduce the probability of another critical reaction taking place. Three operators in the immediate vicinity of the radiation received the largest doses of radiation during the accident. The two of them standing closest to the sump, Hisachi Ochi and Masato Shinohara, received 17 and 10 sieverts of radiation respectively. Ochi died 82 days after the accident. Shinohara, who was a little further away, died 210 days later. The third employee, Yutaka Yokokawa, was luckier. He was sitting at a desk further away when the reaction took place. This saved his life. Yokokawa spent three months in the hospital and was eventually able to return home. In the first hours after the accident, nearly 49 people were irradiated, 30 of them being plant employees. However, this figure later rose to 663 people. The radiation doses these people received weren't very high. They didn't exceed 50 millisieverts and didn't cause any serious long-term complications. Therefore, there are only two official victims of the tragedy, the plant employees who died. Hisachi Ochi and Masato Shinohara. After the accident, court proceedings involving the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency began against JCO. First, JCO's operation credentials were cancelled. In 2001, a trial began to identify those responsible for the incident. For Japan, it was the first ever trial regarding an accident at a nuclear facility. The verdict was not announced until three and a half years after the accident. On March 3, 2003, six people were found guilty. They were sentenced to various prison terms and were ordered to pay fines for failing to comply with workplace safety regulations. Among others, former plant manager Kenzo Kojima received three years in prison and was charged a fine of $4,300. In addition to the individuals punished in the court order, JCO was also fined. It was forced to pay the state a fine of 1 million yen. At the time, this was equivalent to about $8,500. The investigation produced two theories as to why the accident happened. The first one suggested that equipment malfunctions were to blame. The devices could have failed, not displaying the actual mass of uranium that had accumulated in the reactor, and then following the incorrect indicators, plant employees continued with the procedure, which led to this tragedy. However, this version wasn't adequately corroborated. According to the second version, human error was to blame, namely through human ignorance and the staff's lack of experience in working with highly enriched uranium. Most likely, the employees simply didn't realize that there was a huge difference between 45 liters of the solution in storage and those same 45 liters in the solvent reactor. In other words, they didn't understand their actions would result in catastrophe. In addition to that, some believe that both company management and state supervisory boards were deeply convinced that an accident like that would never happen. 
They believed that there was no way a critical mass of uranium could be achieved within the plant's facilities. And since they didn't expect these situations to arise, employees didn't prepare for them, nor did they follow regulations in emergency situations. Subsequently, the Tokimori accident received a level 4 rating on the International Nuclear Event Scale, or INES. For reference, the 1986 disaster at Chernobyl received a level 7 rating, denoting the highest possible level of danger. The Tokemura accident remained Japan's largest nuclear-related accident for 12 years. Then, in 2011, it was replaced by the accident at the Fukushima 1 nuclear power plant, which became the most destructive and dangerous disaster in the history of Japanese nuclear power. Like Chernobyl, the Fukushima accident received a level 7 INES rating. Thankfully, they managed to avoid a global catastrophe in Tokemura. The accident was localized within a day. Most of the harmful volatile substances stayed inside the plant and were later collected by special air filters. Some radioactive noble gases still managed to get into the atmosphere, but because these substances have a short half-life, the surrounding area wasn't in harm's way for long. And within a few days, those who lived adjacent to the production site were able to return to their homes and continue their normal lives. This accident serves as a perfect illustration of the consequences of neglecting safety principles. Human error stands alone as the main reason for this dangerous incident. When working with a peaceful atom, any mistake, no matter how small, can turn into a disaster. What do you think? Do companies adequately control the processes in their facilities? And do you think governmental supervisory agencies are comprehensive in their work? Share your thoughts in the comments, like this video, and be sure to subscribe to the Simple Infographics channel so you don't miss out on new, interesting videos.